Hi, I'm Dwayne Brown. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, supporters and opponents of Proposition 8 are welcoming news from the U.S. Supreme Court. The justices will hear arguments about California's same-sex marriage ban. And vandals damage San Diego's first large-scale memorial to Dr. Martin Luther King just two months after it was unveiled. And I'm Peggy Pico. Coming up on our weekly roundtable, Oceanside City Council tries to seize control from their mayor and boot him off San Diego's transportation agency. Plus, our conversation with San Diego City Council member Todd Gloria about his so-called sexy city plan that includes paving the city's roads and filling in potholes. On this 71st anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor, the story of a survivor who's making sure those who died are known and remembered. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by... Good evening. Thanks for joining us. U.S. Supreme Court will hear arguments on California's same-sex marriage ban. The High Court says it will review the voter-approved Proposition 8 and the Federal Defense of Marriage Act, or DOMA, the 1996 law defining marriage as between a man and a woman. Gay rights advocates in San Diego are optimistic. We're pretty excited that we're going to have our day in court, and we're very hopeful that as in 14 uh, past occasions, the court will um, reaffirm that marriage is a fundamental right for everyone. Same-sex marriage opponents say they hope the court will uphold the ban, while arguments in these cases are narrowly focused on Prop 8 and DOMA. Constitutional law professor Glenn Smith says there's no way to hear these cases without looking at whether same-sex couples should be treated equally under the Constitution. He had this prediction. Predicting the court is always difficult, especially for this kind of an issue. It's likely to come down to one or two justices, probably Judge Anthony Kennedy. I have a, a prediction that ultimately he will decide that same-sex marriage equality is required by the U.S. Constitution. But whether he's comfortable doing that in these decisions and just resolving it or whether he wants to take a half step and then save for the next case or a couple years from now, the next you know, extension of that is, is sort of hard to say. The Supreme Court will likely hear arguments beginning in March and issue a decision by June. A warning tonight about what could happen to California's economy if the federal government doesn't deal with possible tax increases and spending cuts by year end. Government and business leaders say it could stop the state's recovery, predicting a loss of nearly $23 billion in goods and services and 225,000 jobs statewide. There's still, uh, there's still been no progress in Washington to avoid mandatory spending cuts or the end of Bush-era tax cuts. San Diego Association of Governments will try to settle a lawsuit over its regional transportation plan. If it doesn't work, Sandag will appeal a decision invalidating the plan's environmental impact report. This week, you may recall, a judge ruled the plan violated state law because it wouldn't meet emissions standards. Sandag says it will work with environmental groups to try and settle differences over interpretation of climate change laws. On our Friday roundtable, Oceanside City Council wants to boot the mayor off the Sandag board. But as Peggy Pico explains, the mayor is fighting back and threatening legal action. Oceanside Mayor Jim Wood said, quote, I'm not going to roll over and die on this after three of Oceanside's five city council members held a preliminary vote on Wednesday to remove Wood from the Sandag board responsible for the region's transportation plan. The mayor and council differ in their opinion on expanding transportation. UT San Diego columnist Logan Jenkins joins me with details about what some are calling a ploy to seize power from the mayor. Logan, thanks for being here. It's my pleasure. Uh, Tell us about why these three uh, basically party majority city council members in Oceanside uh, want to get Wood off the Sandag uh, board. Well, they would have liked to have gotten him off the council altogether by defeating him as mayor. Jerry Kern, uh, uh, an incumbent councilman, ran against uh, Wood, lost decisively by something like 24 points. So the next best thing for them was if you can't defeat Wood at the ballot box, 
take away his one large power as mayor, and that's to appoint himself as the Sandag representative. And Wood is considered a moderate. He's a moderate Republican. Uh, the other three, uh, Gary uh, Feline, Jack Keller, and Jerry uh, Kern, as you mentioned, who lost the election by quite a large margin, um, they're much more conservative. Do you mm. think this is part of the uh, bloodbath, as you've called it up there, or a personal vendetta? Well, they, they really don't like each other, and it goes, it goes back a long time. Oceanside has a history of partisan politics sort of pitting the downtown chamber of commerce versus the neighborhoods and the mobile home parks. Wood represents those neighborhoods and mobile home parks. Right, he kept the mobile home parks which made him very popular and, and the, the other three uh, were not uh, the, the, for that. The, they wanted to, to, to lift the uh, rent control. Right. Now this council's measure, that preliminary vote on, um, on Wednesday, I understand, would give the council the uh, authority to veto a mayor's nomination to uh, a board. They could make their own appointments and they could remove city representatives on boards that uh, they don't care for the city representatives representatives and what they're doing. Um, first of all, is that legal and how typical is it? Well, it's, it's not untypical uh, that a board majority would have uh, the power over, over appointees. It's been the custom. It's been the, the, the tradition in Oceanside for the mayor to have this power. But Oceanside recently became a charter city. Uh, and now I think they believe that they have the green light to make whatever rule they want. I think as a charter city, right, they, don't they get to decide on these sorts of uh, things? It, it sure appears so. That's what the city attorney has advised. Wood is not convinced. His uh, Wood's ally, who's Esther Sanchez, she's a public defender. Uh, she's an attorney. She's said that, the, that, that, that they're going to fight it. So it's just another uh, another chapter. Um, Wood originally said he was going to sue them, and then now what is he saying as far as his legal uh, counsel? He's going to check with the, with the state attorney general, but he's also used the R word, meaning that, that some of his supporters may be inclined to recall one or more of the uh, council majority. And that's been tried before. It was tried in 2009. And so... Uh, uh, it's just part of uh, part of the playbook of Oceanside. The the uh, yeah bloodbath playbook, as you were mentioning mm -hmm. earlier. Um, the, the, also, I wanted to mention that Mayor Wood wanted to charge the city for his legal counsel. Is that's correct? Co that's correct, and that, and you know there's probably some pushback from uh, from that from even some of his supporters. So he's uh, he's dialed that back. What about um, Sandag's 40-year transportation plan? As you know, was re rejected uh, by a court. Um, does that make sort of this talking point mute? Does that make wood, will they lighten up on uh, moot? I mean, would that sort of lighten no, them up on wood? No, I, do, I really don't think so. I think Oceanside has a weighted vote, something like 5%. Mm. And, uh, and I do believe uh, that, that the majority believes that, uh, that these projects, that, that these arterial expansions in Oceanside would have a better chance of going through if they, if they were in control. All right, I guess we'll be following this pretty closely. Logan Jenkins, columnist for UT San Diego. Thanks so much. Thank you. San Diego's first large-scale memorial honoring Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. has been defaced by vandals. It apparently happened overnight between Home and Euclid Avenue along Highway 94. Caltrans crews were able to wash off some of the pink paint fairly easily today, but it's asking the public to help identify the culprit. It took seven years to complete the project. The mural was just unveiled about two months ago. The artists are professors from San Diego State. They actually used anti-graffiti material to make it easier to clean. The annual December Nights Festival underway right now throughout Balboa Park. Museums and houses of hospitality are, are open for free with lots of live entertainment. The event formerly known as Christmas on the Prado runs until 10 tonight and again on Saturday with a wide variety of food from all over the world. There will also be music at the Organ Pavilion with its giant Christmas tree. Then the rest of the events for December nights kind of kick off at noon tomorrow. The museums don't become free until 5 till 9 in the evening, but if you can get here a little bit earlier, you're not going to have nearly as much crowd. You can enjoy a lot of things and maybe kind of scope out some things you might want to see later on. Last year, more than 300,000 people attended December nights over its two-day run. San Diego's new city council president wants to tackle the nearly $1 billion backlog of repair and building projects. Peggy Pico talks with him about his sales tax plan. 
The city's newly elected council president coined the phrase sexy streets as a way to generate interest in the city's backlog of infrastructure projects, including street, building and sewer repairs. And he wants to get a conversation started on how to pay for it all. Joining me with details of his plan is San Diego Council President Todd Gloria. Welcome back to the show, Todd. Thanks for having me on. So you generated quite a buzz, the sexy streets in San Diego, um, but your plan is actually uh, more than just involving repairing streets. That's right. You know, streets are the most visible representation of our infrastructure deficit in the city. But the reality is, as bad as our streets are, our sewers, our storm drains, our sidewalks, our alleys, our public facilities are all also in really poor condition, and we have to do something about that. And you're also including libraries, rec centers. Our public facilities are our libraries, our rec centers, our firehouses, our police stations. All of these places that the public interact with, uh, which have you know leaky roofs, uh, poor facilities, and outdated, too small, no longer serve the community well, and we have no real plan for how to deal with all of them. You talk about the huge backlog, and it's almost uh, nine hundred million dollars. Yeah. Break out for us the costs that are estimated in each of sort of the three major areas. Well, it's roughly uh, four hundred and seventy-eight million dollars on streets alone. When you throw in about one hundred eighty-five million on those facilities, the libraries, the parks, et cetera, uh, and then two hundred thirty-five million for our storm drains. You know, we have a really big bill, and there are actually people out there who even disagree with those numbers and feel like they don't include the entire universe of needs. But the fact is, the problem is quite large. If it's nine hundred million for your viewers at home uh, it's a our annual general fund budget is 1.2 billion so if it's a 900 million dollar problem you see just exactly how big this thing is and how much we need to address it in context what's being spent right now on infrastructure in san diego well we're spending more than we ever have but that's exactly why i'm trying to raise this issue even though we're spending we went from almost nothing for roads only a few years ago i mean literally almost nothing uh, to a couple 10 million now and so you're starting to see the road repairs in the community we would our independent budget analyst says that we'd have to spend almost 30 million dollars more or just to keep up on our roads just our roads. That doesn't include the storm drains, the public facilities, all those other issues. When you start throwing in sidewalks and alleys, again, you see the size of the problem is far too large to address the ex way that we're currently addressing it. One of the ways you thought to pay for this was about a half cent sales tax. Tell us about that plan. Well, no, I did not say that. You, you did know, not. In my swearing in speech, I gave four examples where other communities or other issue areas have tackled this problem. Two were outside of our community, San Antonio and Phoenix. Phoenix. And locally, we've used Transnet and Proposition MM. When that's a property tax. But some of those are tax increases, some are not. But the fact is we can't tackle it if we don't have this conversation, if we don't identify this as an issue. And the reason I think it's an issue is that not only does it mean you know people are tripping and falling on sidewalks or their cars are being thrown out of alignment on our streets, but it's a competitiveness issue. We cannot bring jobs and job creators to this community if they see a horrible state of, of infrastructure. And you were talking about the other cities. I know Phoenix, uh, I'm familiar with that one. Um, they, uh, they, I think, actually did a little sales tax that actually got voter approved but the voters rejected here in San Diego a sales tax hike back in 2012 do you right. think they would approve it for something like this well I think this is the most likely one if there were a tax increase and again there's no necessity no, there's no uh, necessity for that but the reason I would is that it would be very specific we will tell every community in this city what this would mean to them if it's a uh, X number of miles of road repair uh, their firehouse gets improved a new library here or there um, it would be very specific and I think that kind of certainty has won voter support we saw that with Transnet with a half cent sales tax for traffic relief and mass transit expansion, or with Proposition MM, where you knew that in your own elementary school what you were going to get if you voted yes. Um, let me ask you this: This is a, probably have to be our last question. Um, how are you planning to get? Obviously, you said the sexy streets and that yeah. sort of a buzz, but really, you're looking for community input on this. Well, really, what I'm doing is bringing out of the shadows a conversation that's already been happening. Our business community has identified this as an economic competitiveness issue, and they have been meeting about it for years now. What I want to do is to bring those conversations forward from our business community, marry them with our neighborhoods to identify what the needs are, what the priorities are, bring them together, and then build a broad coalition, taxpayer advocates, business, uh, everyone at the table, and then go forward in 2014, 2016 to once and for all address this problem. We have talked a lot about pensions. We have solved that issue by transferring to 401ks. What we need to do now is address our infrastructure problem with the same vigor. So you're gathering the information. Mm -hmm. um, will this need to go to a vote uh, for voters? Is that the master plan in the end? Well, I think for the size, if we really do want to tackle this problem meaningfully, we do need to go to the voters. Um, that doesn't necessarily have to include a tax increase. Again, other communities have gone to the voters without one. But what we have to do is engage them because ultimately this is their city. Um, and I'm trying to lead on this issue. People uh, need to know that this is a problem. Far too few people talk about it. It's easy to ignore our storm drains. They're underground. But they need attention. So do our roads. So do our public 
public facilities, we can do better than this, and that's what I'm aiming to do. All right, City Council President Todd Gloria, thanks so much for talking with us. Thank you. Today is the 71st anniversary of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. That attack and 9-11 can raise the tolerance for considering torture as a tool. It's a question being considered right now at the San Diego Museum of Man. KPBS arts and culture reporter Beth Accomando shows us, and we want to warn you, some of the images in this story may be disturbing. The San Diego Museum of Man's Instruments of Torture features such iconic implements from the last four centuries as the Iron Maiden, the Rack, and the Guillotine. All of the artifacts come from the Museum of Torture in Italy. The two museums previously collaborated on a similar exhibit more than a decade ago, says Rex Garnowitz. I think that our perspective on torture has changed significantly since this was brought here in 2000. And part of that um, has been the effect of the terrorist attack on America on 9-11. And we wanted to talk in this particular version of the exhibit about our capacity to torture other people. Garnowitz is the chief operating officer for programs and collections. He points out that the exhibit's title does not merely refer to the artifacts on display. We're the instruments of torture. We were in the Middle Ages. We are today. The museum has a mission to inspire human connections by exploring the human experience. And torture is a dark part of that experience, but an important aspect to try and understand. Garnowitz says the medieval instruments of torture are not just relics from the past. I originally started talking about this component, these medieval instruments, as a slice in time, but I realized they're not a slice in time, that some of these techniques of torture have continued to today. Kathy Anderson is executive director of Survivors of Torture International. The latest report by Amnesty International notes that 101 countries currently use torture on a systematic basis and that there are survivors from having been tortured. Some do remain in their countries, but many have to flee for their own safety, and they go to countries of safe haven, such as the United States, and specifically to San Diego, as we're on the busiest border crossing. I had no idea there were so many survivors of torture in San Diego. Over 11,000 survivors of torture in San Diego County is actually about the same number of torture survivors as homeless people. You see the homeless all the time, and they're visible, but the survivors of torture are invisible. So the museum wanted to place the exhibit in a contemporary context for visitors. When they walk into the exhibit, actually the first panel shows the bombing of the Twin Towers. It elicits sort of an emotional response from people. We've been attacked, and the reason for doing that is we want to explore our capacity as individuals to torture other people. We say that we won't torture, but if we're put in the right situation, we do torture. And being attacked as a country, I think, made us feel um, like we would do anything to prevent this from happening again. And so you get the ticking time bomb scenario that's played out in the media. Where you have this limited amount of time, you have a terrorist suspect in custody, would you torture that person to save the lives of 10,000 other people? And that sort of moral dilemma that you're faced with makes you sort of make an emotional decision. Like, yes, I would torture that person to save all these other people. Prior to 9-11, we as Americans always said torture is horrible. And that is not a value of our country. It is not part of who we are. It's not our character. 9-11 happened. And then there were conversations about, hmm, I wonder if torture is OK or not. We as an organization, we always say torture is never, ever OK. The exhibit highlights instruments of torture, like the Spanish Inquisition's interrogation chair that was designed to elicit information from victims. But Garnowitz says the exhibit dispels the myth that torture is mainly used to gain information. Ninety percent of the cases of torture, they don't want any information from people at all. They just want to instill fear. And to use fear to control people. Devices like Scold's Bridal were used specifically on women. They were used to keep women in domestic servitude in the Middle Ages. So if you spoke up against authority or took a stand against an issue, you could actually be subjected to some of these really horrible tortures that you see in the Middle Ages. All of these public humiliations 
are used to control populations and to keep people from speaking up. And I think it's important for us to reflect upon that and see that that happened in the past in order to prevent it happening in the present. By allowing people to see some of these real devices makes an impact that photos and videos simply can't convey. Garnowitz felt that emotional impact firsthand. This, this is actually the object that I find the most disturbing out of this entire exhibit. They're saws that were used to saw people in half. And that seems like it's bad enough in and of itself. But when you read the stories, people were hung upside down so that blood would remain in their heads and they'd remain conscious for a longer period of time. So the amount of thought that went into some of these forms of torture and cruelty is really unbelievable to me. I think people are, are genuinely interested in this topic and they want to know more. So I'm really glad that the museum has chosen to have the exhibit here in San Diego to continue the dialogue. What we wanted to do is at the end of the exhibit allow people to see some light at the end of the tunnel. So these are some things people can do to stand up against torture. We look at the bystander effect and how we tend to be bystanders and how we can be upstanders. And some of the upstanders that are highlighted uh, on that panel are ordinary people. That's the message the museum wants people to leave with, that we all have the ability to stand up against torture. Beth Accomando, KPBS News. I'm Judy Woodruff. On the next news hour, the latest jobs numbers, Shields and Brooks, plus trouble for shellfish in northwest waters. That's Friday on the PBS News Hour. A fire weather watch goes into effect at noon on Sunday through Monday evening. That means windy, dry conditions are expected. Partly cloudy along the coast this weekend with temperatures in the 70s. Sunny inland and a little warmer in the mid to upper 70s. Much cooler in the mountains, 50s and 60s. And the desert is in for a cool down the next few days. And in our weekly public square, our story about a group of senior atheists at La Costa Glen, a retirement community in Carlsbad, generated a lively discussion. The founder of the group, called Atheist Anonymous, said other residents at the retirement center have bullied her for her atheism, even calling her the Antichrist. On our website, Peking Duck commented, the snarky comments they get from brainwashed old biddies is just one more example of how religion breeds intolerance and hate. But web user Otai CEC thought the opposite was true, writing atheists are the least tolerant of any worldview. The reason your atheist group studies religion is to mock it and publicly vilify those of faith. But Ben from California responded to that thread with pure poppycock. Go on any atheist forum on the internet and you'll find people raising money for people in need. You can join in on this conversation or comment on any KPBS news story by following us on Twitter, liking us on Facebook, or just email us at publicsquare at kpbs.org. 2,400 Americans died when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. More than a quarter of them were buried without being identified. But one survivor couldn't accept that, so he set out to restore names to the dead. His story from Ross Simpson of the Associated Press. Like many on December 7, 1941, Ray Emery was caught off guard by the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. I thought at the time that, uh, you know, that this is really a good mock area, don't think like that. So I pulled the cover off the, the rest of the way, and about that time another torpedo plane going by, and I saw their big red ball, and then I realized it was the Japanese were attacking Pearl Harbor. By the end of the attack, 2,400 Americans were dead. More than one quarter were unidentified. The unknown are buried at the National Cemetery of the Pacific in a volcanic crater known as the Punch Bowl. Ray Emery first learned of these graves during a trip to the cemetery shortly before the 50th anniversary of the attack. This year, the 91-year-old former sailor is being honored by the Navy and the National Park Service for his work to identify the unknown since that visit. He's devoted uh, to the idea of the accuracy of all the casualties, uh, where these casualties are buried, not only at Punchbowl, but other cemeteries. Using the Navy's burial records from archives in Washington, Emory determined which ships the dead in each grave were from. Gravestones now show markers for the USS Arizona, USS Oklahoma, 
and USS West Virginia. Emory has also lobbied for forensic scientists to exhume the skeletons of those who might be identified. It's just something I got involved with that was very, very interesting and probably in spite of trying to tell the government they screwed up maybe a little bit here or there that we've been able to solve some of the mysteries maybe of World War II. So far, Emory has pushed the government into relabeling more than 300 gravestones with the ship's names of the deceased all in his effort to have Pearl Harbor remembered and remembered accurately. Ross Simpson, the Associated Press. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. You have a great weekend.